Tetris is my main main achievement in my life. Uh, well, I I I dream to become kind of game designer, and uh, at, as soon as I got the access to the computer, I start to put together the small puzzle games, and Tetris was just one of them. But uh, appears to be very lucky game and. I'm happy that I created it. Well, basically, yes, I was fascinated with all kind of riddles, puzzles, and other mathematical stuff. So I was, I was very interested in mathematics, and that that became my job in life. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, I I like all these small riddles when you put together the stuff. So. So base of Tetris was the more or less famous puzzle called Pentamina. It's a box with different shapes made out of five squares. And uh, you kind of play with them, you put them together somehow. And uh, But when you try to put it back in the box, when you are done, uh, it's quite a challenge to do. So, <laughs> so many people spent good hour to to put them back together so i was in love in this in this puzzle and i tried to put some kind of computer version of the game together when and uh, when i when i start programming it the tetris, tetris game came out well when i create the game i well well any entertainment software didn't exist in my country that time. As a matter of fact, it was no even software market in, in, in Soviet Union that time. Most of the computer was mainframe computer controlled by the punch cards. And, uh, but in Academy of Science, where I used to work, they, we have our first personal computers. So the games was quite unusual stuff, and uh, and nobody know how to relate to the <laughs> to this phenomena that I create such a, such a addictive game. So basically, I, at this point, I uh, decide that I want it to be published. So I I let it go. The only way we distribute software that time was just an authorized copying. So we give a copy, we copy on the disk and give give up the disks, and the disk being copied and that's like a wooden fire goes everywhere if the software is good. So that's how Tetris become kind of popular among the the people who work on computers. Wasn't too much people that time. <laughs> We've heard about the the desire to make the kind of bio movie about us and about our deal, and uh, I I didn't have very very big expectation because well it was very exciting moment for for myself and this stuff, but it's nothing to do with James Bond or any kind of really serious and kind of deep adventure of of the people we i was just kind of boring programmer <laughs> at computer centers so, uh well the event and the adventure was very was uh, were really exciting for me but but for me only that's what i that's what what i felt but when i read the script it it seemed to be an interesting story well, well, basically, we were in love with the games. He showed me uh, uh, he he has uh, he has small small TV set with him and uh, and Nintendo machine, and he showed me how it works. I never see the video platform before, so I was very excited, and I have several games to show to him, and he was the first competent person i could explain and show my my game my ideas so so we 
we came from different world, but we actually live in one kind of very important reality for us, which is which is game design. I was sent the um, the script and just fell in love with it. Thought it was so fun and fast paced, and just thought it was amazing. And um, I went on tape, and I had a mullet at the time, so I was doing a different project, and I looked a bit feral. And uh, John rang me, the director, and said, um, "Can you do the same tape, exactly the exact same, but can you cut your hair and just sort of scrub up a bit?" Um, so I did that and wore a suit, and um, and then he asked me to do it. Yeah. Well, I think there's this classic thing of you know wanting to impress your father, but also you know wanting to destroy him. I don't know if it's sort of Oedipus complex or whatever, but it's it's this constant thing of he's the scenes where I feel like he's becoming his father when he's berating Stein. Um, I, I sometimes wonder if he's doing that because he's slowly becoming his father, or if he's doing that to impress his father. John texts me a photo of. Roger in the full prosthetics, and I just thought he was sending me a photo of, of Robert Maxwell. So I sort of looked at it and went, that's a weird text. Like, you know, I don't know why he sent me that, and I looked again, and then he wrote, your dad, and I, I was like, oh my God, that's, the makeup people have done such an incredible job. And then it was last week when he showed up on set for the first time in the full suit and the makeup, and it was just, there's no acting required for me, really, and I just sort of have to look at him, and it's, it's all there. And he's incredible, a really generous actor, and he's just a pro, you know, he's just so good, and he's um he's been great to work with. Working with Taron has been amazing. He's he's incredible. I mean, the guy's just a star, you know, he's really just um he's a great leader and a great sort of captain of the ship, and he's um yeah, he's a great actor. And Toby Jones is, you know, a legend. Working with John's been amazing. He's uh he's just an incredible director. He's got um a sort of He'll probably hate me for saying this, but he's got like childlike wonderment or something, you know, like but he just wants to try everything and he just feels so excited to be on set and it's, it, it makes you feel excited and he he allows you to feel very comfortable very quickly and um, very invested in your choices and is very sort of actor-led. He lets you sort of just feel out a scene and he'll just sort of pick up. He's brilliant. I, I re really enjoy working with John. The one word when I was meeting with the costume designer was privilege. And um, I just wanted everything to sort of exude privilege um, and the hair to be sort of quite perfectly quaffed. I wanted him to sort of get up in the morning and really have a, a good, long, hard look at himself and uh, make sure he was, you know, tip top, best shirts, best suits, it's all a power statement, the watch, the rings. And that first part, that first like six weeks where you're formulating your plan is the same wherever you may be shooting it, I think. And then certainly once I'd kind of presented those ideas to John and John was kind of on the same belief that we thought we were going to go for a kind of very desaturated, washed out, largely blue palette for our Russia stuff. It would be far more primary for our American stuff. And then we would go with more pastels for our Japanese stuff. Once we'd kind of all settled on, on that way forward, then, then you started to knit how we were going to try and make the locations work, you know, whether it was going to be in Glasgow. We were originally, we did look in at, to be in London and Budapest, and before then it was going to be in, Ber in Berlin. So we, we'd got our, our kind of, our, our MO for the film, and then we just had to try and marry them with the spaces that we were able to find, or, or not, in which case then we were, then, when we, then that we would have to build. John and I were on board together with with what I wanted to do with the film from the start, and he was he was very much kind of I mean when you read the film, it talks about you know Hank saying that when he was first over in or maybe that was the the documentary that I watched. Yes, it was a documentary I watched with, about Hank when he was over in Russia. He said they'd literally like switch the color off. It was just became all gray. So you 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 have an immediate starting point from the documentary and the research and the script. I mean, it kind of designs itself, really. You don't really have to force it in one direction because it just kind of sits very nicely together. And so so very quickly, John and I were on the same page in terms of where we wanted to take it. Um, and then and then Alvin kind of came in quite late because he was only on the project. He was only on the project with maybe six to seven weeks left. And we'd already developed a kind of a way forward with both John and with Nat. And in fact, 
Nat phoned me and we talked about what we were doing and it was it was we'd already into line we kind of come into line quite quickly because because it's the the script kind of commands you to do that really you can't push it in one way because it just won't go that way when Alvin came in we talked about whether or not the desaturation was going to be done in camera or that he was going to take it out in post um, so we did a few camera tests and, and worked out that, you know, there were some some reds actually that wouldn't work. So we had to be quite careful with our Soviet flag regs because when he desaturated it, they would go a bit brown. So we had to make sure that there were some colours that we, we went slightly brighter knowing that we were going to turn them down in post. And there were some things that 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 kind of behaved more or less as you would imagine if they were if the color was taken out so we we used a lot of blues a lot of grays um the oranges became a bit more pastely we tried to stick a, steer clear certainly for exterior russian stuff of any warm tones so there weren't really any yellows aside from our soviet flags there weren't kind of reds or oranges and we just tried to cool it down all the time for that um and Nat was kind of reflected that with his costume design too. Kremlin was going to go really white as per all of the reference. And it was lots of gold and red carpet. Valentin, we were going to go with a bit more wood finished and it was going to be blue carpet. And then Elog was going to be a lot more earthy because, because well, they were the, the, the bottom of the pile. Um, so, um, so, we looked for we looked at the Glasgow City Chambers, we looked at Edinburgh City Chambers, um, and there was another location that we were looking at for our interior Kremlin, but nothing quite hit the kind of the opulence level that we wanted for the Kremlin. Although Gorbachev is Gorbachev isn't quite like that. Um, and then when we found the Signet Library, it was just perfect because it was it was absolutely stunning, over the top, very opulent. And if you think about the you, you, don't, you've, you haven't seen the other spaces, but we've got this huge disparity in, in the kind of level of opulence for the film. We've got kind of where Alexei gets thrown, which is kind of guarded by the KGB in this little in this squalor. And then we've got the, the Kremlin. It's, it's a huge, huge spread. Well, Elog was a funny one because Elog, we knew what it looked like in reality. And it was a very kind of neoclassical mansion that was on the outskirts of Moscow but didn't really feel that that really worked with our uh, the spectrum of buildings and architecture that we had through the film. Um, and we'd already hit neoclassical a couple of times with our Kremlin and with our, um, um, and with our Valentin's office. So we wanted to go something slightly different with that. So we made that 60s, a, a more 60s build, which matches to the zoology building up here in Aberdeen, which funny enough, when John said to me, I think we're going to be shooting in Scotland. Have you seen any brutalist buildings in Scotland? The building that we're shooting in today, the building that was Elorg, is the first building that I sent him a photograph of. So it's nice that it's done a complete circle. And actually, it's the building that he went, John went to university in. We've managed to find a DVK-3, which is a model of an Electronica 80, which is the computer that Alexei coded Tetris on originally, that that we got shipped out of Moscow, although it got held up at customs for about two weeks, got shipped over. We then 3D printed it, 3D scanned it, 3D printed it, and then have then made eight. So we, in the Moscow Computer Science Center, he's coding on a, on a kind of our version of a DVK-3, which is the Electronica electronic 80, which is the one that he really coded on. So that's quite nice to make sure that we've, we've done our right level of homework and we've got a real computer out of Moscow that we've, we've scanned and rebuilt or made v versions of. We've almost definitely got an angle that way all the time, but obviously, Undoubtedly, there's going to be two people having a conversation and you're going to need the reverse. And it's we, we have often had to kind of either cheat the reverse or shoot it a lot lensier. So we're softer behind or we've had to frame it in a way that we're, you know, up underneath the eye line. So we're into sky. So so we, we have struggled, obviously, often finding finding the reverse. Yeah. Or we're only able to bring them in from there to that rather than a nice kind of sweeping move to reveal something. And. And I'm sure there's going to be a f loads of CG, but certainly any kind of developing shot where we'll kind of lift off from them to reveal a wider environment, there's going to be that to replace, that to replace, that to replace, that to replace. 
but that would be the same, I think, even even if we were to do it in Russia now, because because we're not in 1988. I think it is about companionship and friendship and that these two kindred spirits on the opposite side of the ocean, capitalist and communist, have kind of come together to f to have this mutual love of of video gaming and and creating something that brings so much joy to the entire country. If you were going to do this this film, what would you do? What would be the first thing that you did? I said I'd have a scout out from tomorrow night looking for the the right architecture, the right locations. Um, he said, okay. Can you come down and meet everybody? Um, and so I sent the scout out and got in the car and drove to London. And by the following week, we realised that we had actually quite a fantastic uh, bunch of options for, for locations of Moscow and London. So um, it was incredible. I think 1980s is uh, is such a fond memory for for those that are middle aged. It's also it's also very trendy right now. Um, it's becoming trendier, and I can I watch the youngsters on the set, the trainees and the the younger uh, members of the departments kind of look longingly at some of the costumes that are appearing on the set. They want to wear them, so. So I think we've uh, we've tuned into a really uh, interesting time. Um, the hairstyles are trendy these days as well. The music's hip, um, and also computer games. You know, teenagers know what Tetris is. Some adults don't. From the beginning, everybody has reached out to try and find those that are willing to participate. Um, and generally, they've been incredibly helpful. And uh, and speaking to Alexei himself, he's he's an absolute sweetheart. Um, and uh, you can imagine the kind of level of detail that that uh, that he enjoys, and he loved reading the script. Um, we're hoping that he makes it over at some point for for a visit. Similarly, Hank has uh, just been adorable. He's even helped Taron um, with the details on his personality, his wardrobe, his you know his taste, um, his motivation, his personality, um, and he's in touch regularly. So. Tetris is a, a it's a really fast it's a really fast moving fight to the death for the rights for something that everybody knows is going to just explode internationally. Um, and it is incredibly exciting and I guess um, audiences these days are very familiar with how addicted people can become to video games. This is the one that started all of that um, and so exciting. Scotland has been wonderful to us providing all this really atrocious weather and we're very grateful for that and thankfully it's fitting because it matches Moscow. Um, and on top of that, um, uh, we, uh, uh, all the film community here have a wonderful relationship with Screen Scotland. Um, Screen Scotland is now run by Isabel Davis, who used to be head of international at the British Film Institute. She studied in Scotland um, and, and her presence here has made a dramatic difference to the industry. Um, we have our first um, uh, independent studio now up and running in Edinburgh and Scottish Government have bent over backwards to help us find locations to accommodate the crew, uh, find and identify cast and crew. And whenever we run into any uh, bureaucratic problems, they're, they're the first to help. So right now, um, I'm happy to say that Scotland is full in terms of in, ter in terms of those that want to come film here. Um, and it's for a very good reason. It's because the infrastructure is so amazing. I have been working with John Baird um, on and off for a few years now. We have been developing an, a, a script together and we've done lots of uh, research and location work on that, casting. Um, and uh, But I hadn't seen him in action until we started working on Tetris together. And uh, I've actually I've found him really delightful and somebody should uh, bottle the energy that, that he has. It's uh, it's relentless. It's amazing. 
He's um, he's he's really determined in a good way. He's incredibly decisive, which I love in directors. Uh, just makes a decision and moves on. Um, and also, I'm never scared to give him bad news because sometimes with you know you got to give bad news on a very regular basis to directors, and and some of them can handle it, some of them can't. John takes it all in a stride. Um, he's he's he genuinely is interested in in uh, people their motivation their psychology and and i think that makes actors warm to him He's, he has a control of the set that i have, i rarely experience um and on top of that he's meticulous he does his homework and never drops a ball toby's just i'd said to i toby jones um is a delight and he's such a professional and uh he's been uh, he's been on set um maybe for four or five days with us now and the mood is completely different when he's there because everybody just shows him so much respect he's really wonderful he's so talented just watching him is a master class in acting Sophia, Sophia, uh, coming into uh, this country, stranger in a strange land, and and obviously you know this is terrifying for her. Would be terrifying for anyone, but um, she's taken to it like a duck to water, and she's got that lovely combination of being uh, 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 that gorgeous fr fragility, um, and then and then really empowered. So she appears that she might be weak, and then then she just turns into this pillar of strength. So. Um, she's she's doing a fantastic job, and we've we've um you know we've 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 really put her through her paces. Um, but she's delighting everybody. Matthew Matthew is a very clever man, and he's obviously um he's very successful in the business. Um, and he's a very strong marketing mind. Um, and he has a very clear idea um, of of what is going on directorially because he's done it so often as well. And I haven't worked with another producer before who's got so much uh, directing experience. So it's really interesting to get his perspective and that level of experience and applying it to this. Um, Matthew's not on set. I'm on set. Um, but he's he's looking at the material all day long, and and he uh, regularly has ideas. And when he does, we we put them to John and we implement them. Um, and he's a great sounding board. Whenever we have uh, any issues, there is no doubt he'll have already dealt with a similar situation at some point. So he's fab to have there when we need him. So my name is Hank Rogers. I am originally the publisher of Tetris in Japan, but I'm more known as the guy who went to the Soviet Union to get the Game Boy rights to Tetris. So Tetris is the most amazing puzzle game ever invented. Uh, of course, what is it to me? It's, uh, it's sort of my business career. I made a business out of it. Um, but Tetris, the, the interesting thing that's different about Tetris is that uh, in other games in general, there's no randomness. There's no real randomness. But in Tetris, it's really random. So you can't predict what piece is going to come out next. And that you have to make a decision every, t every single time. And a lot of people go through life without making decisions. And so this is a decision, decision, decision game. And that's where I think that's the pleasure center it hits. Watching Taron Edgerton play me in a movie is amazing. I mean, he's, um, how can I say, so em uh, filled with emotion uh, and and he takes all those scenes so seriously. Um, it it it's it's sort of like uh, nostalgia for me, uh, you know, having to convince my wife to do this or the that and the other thing. And he's actually doing it. It's amazing. We we did a zoom, uh, you know, before he actually did any of the shooting, so we did get to interact. Um, what can I say? It's it's strange watching somebody else be me. <laughs> uh, uh, I, he does a pretty good job. That's what, what I can say. Um, yeah, he was m much more emotionally convincing than I was. I would say, um, you know, there was no acting involved when I went to Moscow or when I deal with my family, my wife. And there's no acting involved, and yet there's like all these extreme emotions of watching. You know, I watched him do a scene yesterday or day before yesterday. It was uh, it was fun to watch. First of all, we could we spoke the same language 
even though his English was like really, how can I say, broken at the time, uh, I was pretty good at speaking English uh, as a second language or speaking to people that spoke English as a second language. Having lived in Japan all those years with, you know, dealing with people who barely spoke English. So the answer is you have to use simple, easy words and maybe some gestures or whatever. Um, but we, we really didn't have a problem communicating. We didn't have language per se, but we were able to communicate. It's really hard to communicate what really happened. And in order to get the, the feeling across of, of you know, me standing inside the lobby of Electronic Technica and having the guy tell me, you know, we never licensed the rights to Tetris for console to anyone. And I'm going, holy shit. I have $2 million worth of cartridges in production in Japan uh, with my in-law's property as collateral. I mean, all of it. Everything that my father-in-law had ever worked for, I had, I had used as collateral for a loan to make those cartridges. So if it turned out that I couldn't publish those games, oh my God, that was, it would have been a disaster. Um, but hey, I, you know, I, I made it through all of that. I uh, got the Game Boy rights, and a month later I was back to get the console rights, make sure, solidify my position in Japan. Whew. Alexei Pajitnov is the original creator of Tetris. Um, sometimes people call me Mr. Tetris, but actually he is Mr. Tetris. I would say if I'm anything, I'm Dr. Tetris because I kept Tetris alive all these years. Um, but it, he created the game. Uh, he was a mathematician and a, a puzzle aficionado, if you, if you want to pick a word. Um, and so he's been creating puzzles all his life, and Tetris is just one of those puzzles. Um, yeah, and he's salt of the earth, nice guy. I'm Igor, and uh, I am the KGB in the movie. Uh, I am Valentin, who's, uh, uh, who's uh, head of a foreign trade department, uh, <clears throat> Communist Party. And, uh, well, I'm one of the main antagonists, some kind of... Uh, uh, I don't know, manipulator, and, uh, well, uh, Terence's character is uh, my and, 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 well, I am <laughs> pain in his I think so. John, uh, director of the film, just great director, and, well, uh, he gave me the, the, well, just amazing opportunity to choose between roles. He said to me, well, uh, uh, Belikov and Valentin, uh, well, I can't choose for you, because, well, well, for me, it was no choice. Uh, sure, sure, the, the evil guy. I, I don't think of him as a villain. Um, in that sense, because, cause, well, he's one of the smartest guys in the, in the movie. I think uh, he's not so dedicated to the dying society as uh, uh, the guy named Belikov. Uh, well, he sees things right, and uh, he knows that uh, how, it be, how it would end. And, well, as I said, he just wants his own piece of cake and to, to, to leave them alone, to uh, uh, make some money and to live happily ever after. I'm from St. Petersburg and, uh, well, there is some similarities between uh, Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow uh, in those small streets, architecture stuff, you know. So, well, I feel like home. The first day was uh, was my first day uh, and, and, and of the shooting. Was the they were shooting my main scene, and it it was from the well, it was uh, six or seven a.m. and well, my first time in Scotland, my first time uh, uh, shooting movie, and well, they began from my main monologue. Main scene when uh, uh, Valentin talks about his childhood, 
and etc etc i think uh, to, well i think to begin is always the most challenging stuff uh, in every project uh, uh, in cinema on, on stage in theater so to begin just to start that is for everyone because uh, it's uh, not only about the game and uh, mainly not about the game just but but uh, about uh, real people uh, about history about about uh, uh, people's intentions uh, about uh, uh, people's uh, choices uh, what choices do they make and uh, uh, well people building their lives and uh, and working for their futures and uh, so about relationships and uh, finding uh, uh, you know a common soul uh, how to say uh, well it's about life it was a game and and, and uh, i suppose i remember the old fashioned uh, the fact that it is black and white and and it was you know played on a a, a game boy i i definitely remember that but of course, it is completely different now, um, you know, and, and the sort of paying it on, you know, smartphones. Um, I certainly didn't know the story. I absolutely didn't know that it was invented by some, you know, by, by a Russian uh, person. I, I didn't know the whole connection with Robert Maxwell and Sega and all that. So reading the script, I, I thought was fascinating, A, for that knowledge. And also, it, it's like a, you know, a fast thriller. And, well, it is a fast thriller, and you just, you know, um, it's fascinating. Yeah. There were quite a few images that had been pulled together by uh, researchers for the film, but I, I definitely went off and, and researched um, the characters because they're real, you know. And, you know, I never think that you should be doing a looky likey, but I do think you try and get the essence of somebody. And, and then it depends on the director, and then it depends on the actor themselves how far they want to go. Um, I mean, in Taron's case, um, Henk Rogers, um, I, I believe he's part Indonesian, so he's got a, a much darker skin tone uh, and a much darker curly hair. And, and I had to make that look on Taron be more believable, so, so everything was pulled back a bit. But I think also the fact that it's set in the 80s, which, you know, there's all big hair in the 80s, um, you know, that it it's... Um, we, we knew we had to push it a little way, but I don't think it would have looked right if we tried to make um, Taron very dark skinned um, and, and not necessary, I don't think. I, I've worked with Mark Coulier so many times and I love the way he works. I like the collaboration with him. I like the fact that, that you know, we would talk about the hair and the makeup together and, you know, we would accommodate each other and, you know, we would, even, you know, I would say to him, are you... I think that hair works and he would say I think that nose works or should we go for the second nose or you know I love that collaboration that it, it's not just two people doing two separate things um and, and so it made sense for me you know to make sure Mark was on board the project um and, and also John had worked with Mark so he was 100% up for him coming on board um and it was it was great and it was again the same thing you know we we, we knew we had to get um, Roger scanned. We knew there was a, a fat suit involved. Um, we did tests on that. We tried different size suits on him. Um, obviously, one then you work very closely with Nat, the costume designer, which I would anyway. You know, with all our characters, you know, it's a whole creative design that that works when you all come together. I, I suppose the prosthetic ones are rewarding because you are completely changing somebody. Um, and, and in, I suppose Gorbachev was, is also quite interesting because Matthew came to us quite late, so we couldn't, well, we didn't have the time to do the full makeup that we did on Roger. So that one's quite interesting because it's smaller pieces, and I've always liked that as well. I like the fact that you can change somebody just by doing very small things, like he's got little cheek pieces on and a nose, and and then obviously we shave the top of his head and then put on um, hair round the side. Um, so I suppose that's reward rewarding because we had to pull it together very quickly. Um, but I do think it is amazing to watch uh, Roger as Maxwell, you know, the, the voice, everything.
The other thing about this film is uh, John was very keen to make sure that, you know, if we had Russian characters, that actually they were played by Russian actors. It, that made it a little bit difficult because obviously availability, getting them in, the COVID, the, you know, the, the visas and all that. So we did get our actors quite late. Um, Nikita, who plays Alexei, um, we had quite a funny um, uh, WhatsApp thing going on where I had him having his he taking his own head shape for me because I knew I had to get him a wig because I knew his own hair wasn't long enough. So that was um, quite entertaining as he was showing me pictures on his WhatsApp of how it was going along. So he was brilliant. And in fact, all the Russian actors are amazing. I mean, their English is so good, but, you know, they, they've brought, I think, another element to this film. Baldwin, who's just fantastic, the DOP, he told us quite early on that he had different coloured palettes from the point of view of lighting and that makes a huge difference to me and I knew that he was going to desaturate uh, the Russians so any colours were, were diffused. I, I was a bit worried about wig colours and skin tones to begin with but actually it, it's fine. I do pump up um, especially Taron's colour uh, because he's, you know, we wanted him to have a little bit more of a tanned look. So I do have to do more on him when, when we're shooting the Russian bit because it is more diffused. But then, you know, uh, I, you know, we've got the Las Vegas bit, which is really bright and crisp, and you know, so it is nice to know these things. And it's also quite interesting when you're watching on set when you look at the, you know, the, the properly set up monitors. Um, how it all looks and in fact of course that also affected the prosthetic makeup uh, which of course I had to pass on to Mark and we did do a little test of you know how much colour it did diffuse um, from their faces. I, I think if it hadn't been for uh, Hank Rogers tenacity we wouldn't have probably seen Tetris uh, to the scale that we're doing now you know. Um, I think that um, his tenacity and Alexi's reluctance at the beginning, because Alexi was very reluctant to to engage with them because he was suspicious of who this guy was, you know. But I think his tenacity and his sort of what makes Hank Rogers Hank Rogers is why we have this. Obviously, you would never have the game without Alexi's brilliant sort of invention. But his persistence in trying to sort of convince Alexi that he was the right guy to partner up with. Um, and, and their result in friendship, yeah, which lasts to this very day, is why we still have Tetris and why it's so popular and why the game has been so successful. Um, but I think it was that, it, it, the, the, the only reason that happened was because of their friendship and, and how it's carried on through to the modern day. Yeah, one, one of the big challenges when you're doing a true story is to, is to take the script and to go, how, if it's based on you know based on real events or real people say how are we going to make this different from a documentary how's it going to be entertaining we're going to we're going to stay as true as possible to the story but make it entertaining for an audience yeah um and i think that's always the the big challenge you know how to entertain but still make it believable and and, tr and true to the actual you know to to, to the real people's story I think the sort of computer graphic element was was hinted at in the script, but it didn't come, it didn't get fully realised until post production. Yeah, we were under so much pressure to to shoot this because uh, it was during COVID. Yeah, that we really just concentrated on the narrative, right, and telling that story and telling the thriller aspect of the story. And I think a lot of the sort of um, computer graphic style transitions or little chapters and stuff uh, came afterwards when we could really sort of sit down with the effects and start to sort of, you know, start to sort of visualise that, you know, and incorporate characters and different ideas. And there was a lot of different people putting in those ideas. Um, but I think that came after, that came more in post rather than, you know, rather than um, being conscious of that during the shoot. I was, I was very conscious of just not relying on that, but being able to tell the tale and not having to fall back on those kind of more gimmicky sort of um, computer elements, yeah. But I think we've got a right, the, the, the nice balance between the two, you know. Yeah, so the music, we, we always had the idea of playing, you know, some banging sort of 80s tracks in there. So we've got, you know, Final Countdown, 
uh, by Europe. That was part of the actual, that's part of a scene in the, in, and that was a lot of fun to shoot. Yeah. Yeah, it was, that was a great scene and, and, and we love doing that. Um, um, and then we've got a few tracks that have been recorded that are well-known tracks like uh, Blondie's uh, Heart of Glass that was, um, uh, we've done, we've, we've got a, a Russian version of that because it, it was, and we wanted to really sort of play on the minor key for that to when Henk arrives in Russia, so it feels as though there's a big threat and then the lyric would be in Russia as well. So just, we were thinking about that and then we've got a, a version, I've got a Japanese version of Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero that was, uh, that was, uh, that we use in the car chase uh, near the end as well. So, you know, there, there was, there was, some of those ideas came before, some of them came in post. It's just an organic process when you're making a movie, you know. Uh, you kind of have to get your main state, you've got, you've got to shoot your main part of the film and concentrate on that. And then, with the music, you know, we, we had a great composer called Lorne, Lorne Balfe who did a, a, a really interesting sort of 80s synth track, yeah, 80s synth score, but also used a lot of the actual Tetris theme uh, as the, the the basis for the score, but not in a very obvious way. And the only t the first time you actually hear what people recognise as the Tetris theme um uh, which is a, a Russian folk song called Korobineki, yeah? Um, that is what the Tetris theme is actually, you know, made of. Da, 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 um, the only time you hear it in full is is at the end of the film during the chase when Valentin's trying to chase uh, Hank onto the plane. It was like a Hansel and Gretel trail that we, that we seeded throughout the score from the beginning and then we sort of paid off. So it was almost like I kind of recognised that and then, okay, it delivered. We wanted to put in more of a thriller sort of chase uh, at the end, you know, to pay off. So, so we worked a lot in the end with Noah um, and, you know, bits and pieces th throughout there. And myself and Noah sort of worked very closely together for, it was almost a year before we went into, into production because we're always getting held up with COVID and, with financing and the script wasn't quite right for the financers to, to, to sign off on. So we, we worked really, we had a very cro close, you know, we had a great close working relationship. I hope people have a fun ride, uh, you know, with, with this film. I hope they're, I hope they're kind of educated in, in the history of it. Uh, obviously, I hope they enjoy the thriller aspect of it with, you know, with the KGB and with Robert Maxwell. I hope they see the humour in it because there are some great funny moments, particularly with, with Toby Jones, who is one of the funniest actors I've ever worked with. He's, he's, he's got a great um, part there in Robert Stein. Um, and with Anthony Boyle, who plays Kevin Maxwell, they've got a really great little duo going on there. That's probably where a lot of the comedy comes from. Um, but, you know, it is heart. It's a story about family and, and it's about friendship. Uh, and I think more so than anything else about being about a game or being about a time in history, that's really what the film was about, you know. So I hope people have uh, a, 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 an uplifting feeling at the end because it is an uplifting film and it's a, you know, it's a success story uh, between these two very unlikely characters. Yes, he is. He's got, um, you know, uh, sort of age-wise, he's similar and the sort of general character of his face is quite similar. We knew we'd be able to enhance it, you know, because Maxwell has these kind of nice folds under here and, um, you know, just looking at pictures of Maxwell next to Roger, you know, we we knew we had to change his forehead and cover his eyebrows and Maxwell's got those huge black bushy eyebrows so those are all hair inserted one at a time uh, to create Maxwell's eyebrows so we knew we'd, we'd be doing that and then it was a case of how much we wanted to transform him into Maxwell or how much we wanted to keep Roger you know so we, we that's always the case really finding the balancing act really. Uh, initially we take a, a, a live cast and then we get the actor in and we do a photo session with them. And then usually I have a play around in Photoshop, you know, transposing one, uh, you, you know, you can even take a picture of Maxwell and cut and paste and 
paint over it and give myself an idea of what it's going to look like. And then um, and then we just start the sculpture, really. I had uh, um, a, a sculptor called Josh Weston, who's been doing a lot of stuff uh, working with me over the last uh, five or six years, and longer even. And uh, he started sculpting on the plaster cast of Roger's head. And that's and then between that, really, we just go to and fro and make suggestions and tweak it around until uh, we get the character. It's becoming a part of it more and more technology. Um, we, in this instance, uh, we have a hand uh, a scanner, a facial scanner in the workshop that I've just purchased. So we're able to uh, take a three D scan of the actor's face now and then three D print it. Uh, what we found this time, when we when we take a life cast, it's uh, it's a, a material, it's a rubber material that's pasted over someone's face and backed up with plaster bandage. And what we found, the weight of the material can distort the shapes a little bit. You know, it distorts the bottom lip, and we found that it distorted this a little bit and the cheeks. So we three D printed that and placed it in into the life cast of uh, Roger before we did the. Um, master mold in order to start the sculpting process, you know, just so that we had the correct expression. So more and more we're using that kind of technology. Um, once the skin texture, at the moment it doesn't scan skin texture as well as taking a life cast. So, uh, but 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 it's not far off now, and it, it will get better and better. And I think once once the skin texture is is as good uh, uh, when it captures all the skin pores and texture uh, as well as a life casting material, then we we won't be live casting anymore. We'll just be we'll just be scanning actors. The basic process is you have your you, know, you take your head cast of the actor. You have a plaster cast, and then uh, you sculpt in in uh, uh, oil based clay, or we do. Uh, we sculpt the whole makeup in an oil based clay. Um, once we've got the character, we then uh, submerge the whole sculpture under water, uh, and we have a, a, a separating material from the plaster to the to the to the oil based clay. Uh, or wax-based clay, um, and then we can lift off various parts of the sculpture. So you, you'll cut through the sculpture, take the forehead piece off, you'll blend away the cheek edge, and then you'll make a, a separate mould of that particular area to make your core, and then you place the forehead piece back on, and that way you separate out the forehead, and you do the same with the nose and with the face piece, you take it off and you make the cores separately. So you, you work in reverse, into the reverse way you're going to stick it on. Um, so if you're going to apply um, the forehead last, that will be the first piece that comes off. And then the nose will come off and then the face will come off. And uh, and then we mold each of those pieces separately. Uh, the mold is open, the clay is cleaned out, leaving the space in between. We spray a plastic barrier on both sides of the mold, pl place the mold back together again and inject silicon into it. And that once the silicon is set, it almost creates like a bag with a dissolvable uh, plastic edge. And that's how we get our final appliances. They're made out of uh, silicon out of a mold. So it's quite a long process, probably six weeks to uh, create this makeup from start to finish. It's, you know, the face. What is it about Maxwell? And he, he Maxwell has a, a flat, flat chin. So we filled this out in, in Roger and he's got a thin lips. And, you know, we've kept some of Roger in there. Um, you know, we didn't want to cover him up completely. It's, it's usually, you know, you can try too hard to achieve your character and then you lose your actor. And it's a fine balance between one and the other. He's pretty much covered, Roger, but it, but the appliances are quite fine and thin. You know, there's not much material on this neck bit. We've just added, we've just widened his jaw. We've widened his chin because uh, Maxwell's got quite a strong chin and it's really just picking out all those anatomical things and using our knowledge of anatomy to make sure that when our Maxwell face moves it doesn't move in a strange way. You can't you can't change where the nasolobial fold lines are for example. If you put them here you know in this smile it's going to buckle weirdly on the actual actor's own. So you, you do have to conform to the actor's facial structure. Jan was uh, making the wig and it's, so it's like, you know, where are we going to end the, end the wig? Are we going to keep Roger's hair at the back and colour that? So that's what Jan's doing at the moment. Her and her team, they'll cover colour uh, um, Roger's hair at the back and the wig ends uh, just below his crown. And then he's got a full lace front. Um, 
you know you've got several options uh, uh, with with the way the hair and uh, the, the the actor's hair and the wig is going to are going to combine. You know, so we just have some discussions and work it out between us uh, with how our prosthetics are going to work and technically how the how the hair is going to work. You know, do you keep Roger's sideburns or do you cover them up and create the whole thing in a wig? You know, and in this instance, it was it was it was better to uh, create the whole temple hair hairline and wig and everything so he's completely covered but keep the back of his hair so you keep all this uh stuff at the nape of the neck the game tetris yeah as soon as john mentioned it you know oh, i'm doing this you know i had a quick look on wikipedia said he was doing this film about tetris and the 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 the, the wrangling about the rights to it you know and so i read up on wikipedia and it's really interesting but yes i i had you know in my uh, flat at the time Myself and my two friends, we were at, I was at art college, I think, and we got the first Game Boy and we just we were obsessed with Tetris because it came preloaded on the Game Boy, which is what this story is partly about. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's huge. It's uh, enormous uh, worldwide, you know. So you, you, reading the script, you do get a sense of how, how much money there was at stake and why these people are all trying to scrabble for the various rights. And I think it was before all this stuff was locked in stone and contracts were were, were much, uh, much tighter these days because everybody's aware of which rights go to what country. And But back then, I think it was probably unusual to have different platforms. You didn't think about the different platforms for the different uh, th different rights, that were, which I didn't know, which is the really interesting part of the whole story, really. Basically, Greg or the other producer called me up, said, it's an interesting movie. I have one to pitch to you called Tetris. I sort of thought, I thought, you know what I mean? I knew the game, I didn't know the, the story. Read the script and I thought it was fantastic. And I thought it was a really great story that, about a very, un, you know, an unknown, an unknown story about a very well-known game. And that got me excited. So, and it, and it was a brand, and I felt it was a movie that people would enjoy and be interested in. Well, Taryn is a good friend of mine, obviously. We've now made, I should know how many movies we've made, maybe five together. Um, and I, you know, I've, with, I thought of Taryn when I read it, because these are characters that have traits which are slightly questionable for likability, but he can take that and sometimes do pretty outrageous things, but you still like him. And that's, that's you know, for me, that's a definition of a movie star as well, which I think he is become one and uh, he plays the role as I, I couldn't imagine anybody else playing the role as well as he does. One of the th reasons I also why I brought this to Apple was you know Apple and Tetris and the birth of Apple and the Tetris and Game Boy and, and you know Steve Jobs, Hank, these were visionaries that you know they broke the rules to make the world better. Not enough people are doing that any any at the moment. I think everyone's become too conservative and thinking in the box. And uh, you know, break rules to make the world better is a great thing to do. Hank and Hank broke a lot of rules. I think the, the fact that it was made in Russia and it, you know, I remember I grew up in the Cold War and we all had images of what Russia was. So it's a sort of you know, originally the script had a two pages of explaining the backdrop of Russia being the enemy of the West, and now by the time we finished the movie, we we're like, well, we can cut that that out. Um, but I think what I found most interesting was was an American going behind the Iron Curtain and to a game that was obviously Russian, but you never, I, I never assumed Tetris was made in Russia. I just felt it was a, you know. Just an American invention for for a game, and the backdrop was just chosen as a marketing tool. Um, and I think, uh, when, and then when also when the villain was the Maxwell family, Robert Maxwell is a fascinating character as well. And you know the great line that it, sometimes you know, I mean truth is greater than fiction. I've now got used to making movies about people that are not only real but are alive, and it's it's a bit of a tricky relationship at the beginning because you know it's sometimes you know those decisions need to be made to make the movie better and um trying to explain that to someone when they've got memories of what it was really like and you think well we can't compress your whole life story into two hours without you know cutting stuff out and change you know or combining moments uh what astonished me when i met hank and alexi is they really are those characters i found it quite funny that you know the first meeting 
Alexi was very pedantic and oh, I'm not sure about this. And then Hank was like, I want Tom Cruise to play me and was all over the, you know, fast and energetic and Alexi very just particular about everything. And um, so um, I was impressed that the script had actually really, uh, and now the actors as well, they really captured what the real people were like. I've always been a producer, you know, and, and, um, and I think it's important to, for my sake and the people I work with, just to remind us that movies can be made for smaller budgets and, and, um, and I like to break talent. So a lot of the crew that we put onto Tetris, you know, Tetris was a big movie for them. These smaller films I do for a training ground and to give me muscle memory of, of that, you know, it's, um, it's important that, you know, at the end of the day, making a movie is a camera script, actors, and when you get into the big budget stuff, you tend to forget that. It's probably easier for me to be involved in the movie set in the 80s because it was the time where, where culture and it was, was, I was ab absorbing it. So, you know, I obviously love 80s music, fashion, film, probably because it was, I was 13 and, and it was, this was fresh, new and exciting. So recreating that feeling wasn't hard for me or to, you know, John's the same age, so John can talk about this more than I can. But, um, th but that's why, you know, I sort of mandated we had to have electronic music, had to use music from the time, um, the clothing, you know, I could look at it and go, no, that's a cliche, you know, because the problem is there was the reality and then there's the cliche of what people think the 80s were. So we were trying to keep it into the, you know, because I was there, I could say that looks stupid or, uh, or not. And, um, Trying to think, there was a you know something about the eighties is that it was it was a time where sort of again eight, the eighties to now is a very similar time where you know it, where basically the world was a pretty tough place to be living in and so art and fun was you know everything got you know music films fashion exploded as a, as a reaction you know reaction to the the dour times we're in so um, I think you know, hopefully. Um, this will inspire kids to see what it was like and go off and, and you know, say, break some rules, make something different. And, and, you know, this decade, I hope will be a decade that stands for, because you know, if you think of the last 20, 25 years, there's been nothing original. So whether it's in music, film, fashion, it's all rehashing what people have done before. So I'm hopefully now will, this will be the beginning of a new era. I grew up around Tetris. You know, my father discovered the game in the late 1980s, and he was responsible for bringing Tetris into the rest of the world, you know, through the Game Boy. So it's always been a part of me, um, and oh, it's just been such an amazing, amazing experience. It's been, it's been such an amazing experience to grow up with this game, just because it's something that everybody's known. Um, you know, we've loved it, you know, played it to pieces when we were growing up and it's still relevant today. Um, and so, yeah, Tetris is, you know, it's, it's beyond a game, it's really a lifestyle. And I'm trying to take that into the next generation of gamers and people. I've been involved from the very beginning of the, of the movie making. Um, I was actually the one that kind of got connected to the director initially and we started off the project really from like finding the writers to writing the script and you know, seeing it into full production today. Um, so I would say like between Hank, Alexi and I, I mean, we've been involved from the very beginning of the, of the production. My involvement has been you know, working with the producers and working with the writer to make sure that the script is written the correct way, in, to make sure that the story's be, being written in the right way, um, you know, giving references like pictures from our old house growing up and our siblings and um, just, you know, talking about how my parents were growing up, how we were as a family. So really, I think we had a lot to do with like kind of the creative part of it, of making the whole script come to life. The movie takes place in like kind of a transformative place in our lives where we go from like living in this two bedroom apartment, only speaking Japanese and supporting this crazy foreigner father into, you know, more of a successful story down the line. 
um, to where we're still running the business and I'm running the company. And so I think you'll get to see some, some of how I was as a child, um, you know, with the relationship that I've had with my father. And, you know, it still exists to this day. So it's really exciting to see. Well, it meant quite a lot because I am of that age when those games came out and the whole kind of, you know, Sega Nintendo Wars and all that. And me and, me and my brother were really into video games. Um, so, you know, I had the original Game Boy and I had, we had like, at one point it was my ambition to own every console that had ever been produced. But then I, we got burgled and so it, <laughs> it sort of, it never happened. But um so it meant a lot to me, to be honest, and I had a lot, you know, yeah, I had a lot of uh, emotional attachment to it, I suppose. Obviously, we've done extensive research on all the different um, countries that, that we visit and, um, you know, sort of separating them out by sort of colours, really. And, you know, that worked through, worked through that with um, Dan, the production designer, particularly because um, he was kind of, he basically we before we even had a conversation about it actually we were pretty much on the same page in terms of color ways and stuff and also with John it seemed like we we had a sort of intrinsic shared vision I guess of um of what these colors and kind of who these characters were pretty much so you know in London it's kind of navies and greys as a sort of a very broad brush stroke and then Russia we're into more sort of sludgy colors um, and a sort of lack of contrast, I suppose, between between tones. And then when we're in Tokyo, we're very much in lighter colours and pastels and, you know, just to lighten it up because we're in a different environment. And and in America, it, we're, we're quite colourful there just to sort of differentiate the things and just get a different feeling as we're going through the film sort of, of travel, I suppose, because there's a lot of travel in the film. I liked his costume because it wasn't, there wasn't, you know, John's very been very trusting I think of me which has been amazing um and you know he's a hung he's from from Hungary and my wife is um a half Hungarian so I've sort of got an understanding of those people um and he's of a certain age and it was just fun to sort of build the character into his costume um rather than just be like well it's a man wearing a suit because he's like a you know he he basically just goes around being a businessman and he's got way more character than that which is which I'm really happy about and the second one probably would be Robert Maxwell I guess because it was it's just amazing uh, I mean you know what Mark Julio and, and Jan have done with his makeup is just phenomenal and it and terrifying as well because when, when he first came out with it and he's got Roger's voice coming out of Robert Maxwell's face and, and I'm kind of like everyone's like what's, what's happened it's still like really confusing but his, yeah, his um, his suits. I'm, I'm really happy with the way his suits have turned out because it's quite a challenge to costume somebody of that size. And obviously, he's wearing a lot of padding as well. So, which was again was Mark Coulier, which was just fantastic. But um, the sort of within the time scale and obviously under COVID conditions, uh, I'm really happy with, with how he's turned out. And he's like a you know he's obviously a very big character in the films. I downloaded uh, downloaded the Tetris in here in uh, Glasgow, and I'm on top list number <laughs> four in Glasgow for one week. I were uh, top four because I was playing, playing, and playing all my free time for about like four days, and then I go, no, 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 stop, stop, stop! I have to prepare my role. It was very familiar to me because when I entered the uh, Alexis house here on the stage. It was like, wow, it was like time traveling. And for me, it was awesome because some things, some little, uh, I don't know how they noticed it, some little things everywhere and the whole atmosphere of it. Uh, I liked it. It felt like home, actually, because I remember my home when I was like four years old, maybe. And uh, there were some things uh, that I found on stage. I even found a book about the theater and I found <laughs> the Russian book about the theater and I found my grandfather on it and it was so so funny really it's i don't know how it's interesting well, lucky for us we have a dialogue with uh we have a meeting uh, internet meeting with alexei the real one and uh, he's actually a very good person very open he was ready to 
teach us <laughs> how it is to be him. And he told me the main thing that I didn't even see that the Hank was uh, that Hank was the first man. Uh, how to say to whom you can talk about? Yeah, to whom you can talk about computers, because he was like an I don't know dinosaur, and in, in Russia he was the first one, the only one, and <laughs> he he can even have like a dialogue about it, and that's that, that's what the point for me, because why uh, they are friends. Alexei is a guy who wants to play, he loves it, and uh, also that he was like a dinosaur in there. He was like alone without no business around him because of the Soviet Union and uh, he even didn't get any royalties for about five, five years or six years or seven years. Yes, it was awful while Tetris is uh, around the world. Taron is the, uh, he's a top professional for me. I just, uh, everything uh, I have to do with Taron is be responsible for my part and then absorb experience. And that's it. Because uh, Every little moment, uh, everything. He's very polite on the stage. I think he's brilliant, and I and, and that's it. I think everybody knows it. He's brilliant, really. He saw in us that we're representing Russia. We know what's going on in there, and of course, I even have to. I even like had a task for my mom, because she remembers that time, and we like have a scene with a, one monologue, and I called her, and she and she said. No, <laughs> it wasn't like this. And uh, surprisingly for me, John, uh, he just he, he just changed the scene. This phrase "falling blocks" is saying everything to me, actually, because uh, there's a lot of blocks between uh, um, I don't know me and my friends, every everybody between everybody. There's lots of psychological blocks. Uh, I don't know. Uh, ego blocks, everything. Even in myself, <laughs> I've got to fight to love myself. And uh, it's about it, I think. It's easy to say it's about love, uh, but not. I think it's about the, the blocks that are falling. Well, I was pleasantly surprised because it's very interesting and uh, strong script, but, and you know, it's always like, wow. And you know, all characters are still alive and uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Belikov, my character, this is a guy who is in charge of all this trade between USSR and the rest of the world and uh, mm, obviously he doesn't know anything about this game as well and so when he got first offer to sell this game, obviously you know he sold it, making some profit for this country because he's in, he's uh, one of a few who um, believes in ideas of communism, to live equal, to do the maximum, and to be happy. So he protects his country uh, from being robbed. So and that's why you know he has these wonderful scenes with. Capitalists uh, protecting uh, a Russian game called Tetris. I left country in 1991 and come back to 2002, 2003, because um, people had no money, no food, no future. Nobody knew what's going to be tomorrow because you know this uh, situation. And, uh, I mean, it was horrible time, horrible time. I mean, uh, uh, me as an actor, uh, theaters were closed. People didn't go to, to the theaters because it was dangerous. <laughs> no salary, no movies. I mean, it, 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 it was horrible, I mean, really. We have a very professional crew. We have amazing cast. We have talented director, and we have, as I said, very strong and interesting script. Uh, what else does the actor need to be happy, you know? I mean, he is open. I like to work with him. It's like a teamwork. He gives you freedom. He gives you suggestion. He gives you right direction if uh, he uh, mm, won't correct you. But he gives you freedom. 
to act to trust you and that's very important you know and i just just i just enjoyed the work with him last five days the fifth day we shoot all scene in all scenes in my office and it's again it's so well uh, written so all scenes for me it's like one flow and just enjoy you know all this process for me just not like this scene or that scene because we have a, such a great uh, cast i mean working with uh, Roger Alam or Toby Jones i mean they they are great theatrical actors and today i work with uh, we will work with Anthony Ball so i mean it's i, ju I just have, have a nice time to work with them so Interior, you know, everything's superb. I mean, it's, it looks like real rush. I mean, there's, well, you know, yeah, you know, they don't know. No, 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 it's beautiful. I mean, and uh, John is so picky. She comes and asks, is it right Russian letters? Is it uh, has sense? Yeah, I, 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 okay, this is, it. no, 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 it's, it's, it's well designed. I mean, everything's so real. No, no, I have no, no doubts. <laughs> There's a lot available online that makes our researches uh, much easier than than before. Uh, you can hear you can hear him speak. You can see him move. Things like that. Um, that's very useful. There are books, um, but I, I was very aware and actually rather relieved that it's not a film about Robert Maxwell because getting the makeup on is four hours and i think i think i might be dead if it was a film about robert maxwell so you know he has he has a specific function in, in this film and so it releases you from a, uh, a, a having to explore absolutely everything about his life fascinating though his life is i mean he escaped from czechoslovakia um in when 1940 i think when he was 16 and made his way round Europe and got to England. I mean, it's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. He can be very contemptuous of Kevin. Mind you, Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin also interrupts him. I mean, it's quite a combative, um, it's quite a combative relationship, I think, which Robert wins. <laughs> it's a very, very exhaustive, uh, uh, process making the pieces. Uh, it's Mark Mark Coulier um, creations, I think they're called, and they're an absolutely brilliant team who are complete, you know, leaders in the in the in the field really. And they make uh, a mold of your face, then they sculpt um, Robert Maxwell's face, and then they, I believe, using. 3D printing, though I haven't uh, seen that, and then they make the pieces that that can make your face more like Robert Maxwell's, which in my case is most of my face has to be covered with these uh, with these separate pieces: neck and chin, uh, nose, uh, forehead, a wig, the eyebrows, which are kind of fitted into the piece that's the forehead it's it's it, it's it's just very very painstaking and then they actually they do a um a system where they have to use they sort of uh, flick with brushes a lot of sort of stippling kind of um makeup on you to give give it the tone and the texture uh, of, of skin and that it just takes a very very long time you just have to sort of give up, give yourself up to that, really. I, I can't sleep during it. If there was a nice dentist's chair, maybe I could, I don't know. But there isn't. I don't sleep, but it's sort of... There's something strangely contemplative about it, really. And then when you look at yourself in the mirror, something I've kind of been used to before when I've done makeups in the theatre, you know, um, it is. It, it it is exactly like uh, you, you put on this mask, and and you have to sort of fill the fill the mask up, if you like. It's a sort of thriller, a comedy thriller in a way, because uh, some of it's quite farcical, almost uh, about how 
how do you get the thing out of uh, Russia when it's still just about the USSR, but everything's chaos there, and everyone's, uh, you know, there's lots of corruption there and people after money, and there's this one man who's made this thing who's made this thing that everyone wants because they could make a lot of money about it uh, from it in the West, who's kind of an innocent. Uh, and uh, I'd say that's what it's about. People, and, and, and you know, will he get his, um, his reward in the end, I suppose. In that time in Moscow, we had lockdown. <laughs> so I got proposal from my agent and um, record a self tape. Got feedback from director John and producer that they like me, and then we went to the next level. They called it chemistry room. I've never done it before. It's very interesting. <laughs> uh, through Zoom, we read with Taran all my scenes, and John, we were rehearsing, searching. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I mean, it's weird, but play through Zoom. I would say that the main idea is uh, like follow your dream and be brave, um, reaching your purposes and dreams. And uh, my character is a just great example of it. Um, her story, um, she's dreaming to become a hero. And in the end, she, she makes a, such a hard decision that put her world upside down. This is the film about two great talents from different cultures. So one talent is a genius programmer, Alexey Pajdanov, another is genius businessman, uh, Hank Rogers, and how they're collaborating, even though they're from really different worlds, but they're collaborating and Tetris appeared worldwide. I had in my childhood Tetris, and I think all children uh, in Russia had Tetris. So I just liked it, and I would say that it's kind of like meditation when you're playing Tetris because you're calming yourself down, and Tetris has connection with uh, this, I don't know, desire that all human beings have to, to create something, to build something, you know, to put everything in order. So it's kind of... That's why it's a hit, I think, the Tetris. John. Uh, <laughs> he's so, so supportive, so kind. I would say he's a captain of the ship and he carries a lot of the team he makes a great atmosphere on the set uh, yeah so and I really like how he feel the scenes his intuition what feedback he gave after scene scenes yeah nuances details so yeah it's really interesting to work with John Taran such an amazing artist oh my god uh, he has such a strong energy. Wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's interesting to observe how he's acting. He's very, very focused and concentrated on the, on the scene, on the character, on the process. So very focused. Russian actors are my favorite. <laughs> I mean, we became friends. We spent so many times together, so much time together. Um, Igor, the, the Valentins. Uh, I worked with him before in Russian film, so I think he's absolutely genius. He has such an interesting charisma, such an interesting nature. I had the game, and I had the game because it was one of the... I got a pack of games that came with my Game Boy Color. I was a little bit young for the first Game Boy, but I got the, the Game Boy Color, the purple thing, and I think it was for my 10th birthday, which would have been an event. 99, um, and Tetris was one of the games that I played. So I knew it from that. It's obviously such a, a, a staple and an iconic game in the, in the gaming community, and that was my first introduction to it. My character, Hank, is a Dutch-born American publisher of games who, at the point at the start of the film, was residing in Japan with his family, and he basically discovers the game at um, at a sort of a games fair in Las Vegas and is immediately able to see its potential. And so he sets about on this kind of mission, really, to secure the rights. And over the course of the story, he learns about the imminent release of Nintendo's Game Boy, has the, the idea to package the game with Game Boy. Um, 
So it's this sort of moment, it, it's, it's this kind of incredible story that sort of happens at this moment of, of cultural zeitgeist really for this, for this game. And Henk is a kind of affable, larger than life kind of cowboy figure really, who kind of goes out on a limb to, to, um, to make his fortune and get the rights to Tetris. He and I spoke, as I said, over Zoom, as is the way that you speak to most people these days in you know, early 2021, to anyone who's watching in the future. Um, uh, and you're right, there is an, always an element of responsibility that comes with playing somebody who is a real person. But it is always a story. It is always a story informed by real events. You know, a lot of what happens in the movie is real, but as ever, it's a film. And for the purposes of storytelling and structure and it being entertaining, there is always some liberties taken. But I personally, for my part, I always just feel if you seek to humanize somebody and make them relatable and three-dimensional, then you are doing them the, the right service, I hope. To anybody who knows anything about acting and, and theatre, you know, Russia is kind of the mecca for a lot of schools of thought about acting and any actors that have undergone any training that's based on the work of Stanislavski. You know, it's obviously held in high regard the world over, but no, nowhere more than Russia. Um, and it really, really shows in the work that, that those guys churn out, you know. Nikita, who I love, is just just such an incredible performer, so kind of alive and available and has such a great facility of warmth. And I think he, more than anyone, is the heart of the, of the film, really, and has a real kind of quiet dignity to him. And then you have, you know, people like, you know, Oleg, who has this incredible experience and, and such a rich history of, of great work, and he's just such an amazing craftsman. It's been such a pleasure to watch him work. And then there's, you know, you have Igor and Sofia and everybody else all doing wonderful supporting work too. So it's been an amazing experience working with this cast. A couple of great suits, um, this one being the hero one. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, there's just this sort of working with Nat, you know, we wanted to kind of bring this element of extroversion out in him to sort of throw him into relief against what is quite an, I would say, austere palette that's being used for Russia in terms of the the lighting and the costume and the set design. And it's just to sort of create this sense that Hank is of the other, really, you know, and is kind of westernized and is, and is, is a stranger and an alien in this land. Um, and then in terms of hair and this thing and you know I'm a little bit rosier than I normally am that's all largely informed by Hank's actual aesthetic you know this is pretty near to, to how he styled himself at the time which is great fun because it's so far removed from me and that's always great pleasure and Jan Sewell was amazing in helping me build this look. I think it was a, it defines a real moment in the lives of people who are anywhere between I would guess kind of you know I don't know, 35 and 60, really, you know, but I'm sure everyone remembers that happening. And it's probably a lovely way of kind of sharing that moment of somebody's past with their children. And um, I think it's, I, I think the reason audiences will enjoy it are probably the same reasons that Matthew Vaughan likes to try and put these things together. It was a sort of colourful, larger than life period of time where people did sort of make themselves look like this and kind of did wear crazy kooky big shawl, you know, and it's it's fun. There's something very sort of sensory and extreme about it that is that makes for great viewing. That's just from an aesthetic perspective. But then you've also got this mad, mad story that's kind of remained fairly hidden for the past 30 years, despite the game being so popular. So it's quite exciting to think that it the sort of backstory to this cultural phenomenon will finally get its moment in the sunlight, as it were.